Founders face mentors and masters. I'm Captain Hawk, CEO of Founders Space, the leading global startup accelerator. I'm also author of the award-winning books, Make Elephants Fly, Surviving a Startup, and The Five Horses. Today, I am with Mike Lander. Mike is a master negotiator, and he is going to teach us the art of negotiation. Mike, welcome to the show, and can you tell us a little about your background? Sure. Uh, thanks for inviting me, Stephen. I'm really delighted to be here. So my background, if anyone looks at my LinkedIn profile, uh, it's very eclectic. Uh, so I've got a varied background. In summary, basically, I've been an engineer for many, many years. Uh, then I was in mainstream management consulting, big ticket management consulting, uh, and then went on an entrepreneurial journey. So I uh, raised some money uh, and bought a company and turned it around. Uh, well, that company was very successful, but I ended up uh, diversifying had to turn it around uh, and then sold one of my businesses and ended up being a procurement person. So I ended up buying an awful lot of stuff for an awful lot of clients, particularly private equity ones. And uh, what I now do is I now turn all of that buying experience uh, and I turn it into working with sellers. So if someone's you know, selling their services, they meet big companies and they meet these people called procurement professionals, I help their seller negotiate better deals with the buyers. So I give them insights into how buyers work and I give them toolkits to help negotiate better on a more consistent basis. That's fantastic. And I know you've negotiated close to half a billion dollars worth of deals in, in your career. And uh -huh. I want to talk about what you've learned. Now, a lot of people get confused between selling and negotiating. They think they're uh -huh. the same thing. <laughs> so I want you to clarify this. I think that's a great topic. And in fact, when we spoke last time, uh, Steve, we, uh, we kind of touched on this, is that everyone assumes that if you're a really great salesperson, you're a great negotiator. And in fact, uh, they require different skills. Um, often salespeople, very, uh, very dynamic, uh, very creative, uh, very personable, very engaging. But of course, as a negotiator, if you look at the flip side of the coin, look at a buyer, typical persona of a procurement person. They are tough-minded. They are highly rational. They are very numerate. They are trained negotiators. It's almost the opposite of a salesperson. And you're one of the first people that actually kind of like had that insight with me of going, you know what? It, actually, you should split the negotiation piece away from the, sal the salesperson often because it's a different skill set. That's where a lot of entrepreneurs, business people get confused. They think it's the same person. They think closing the deal is negotiating the deal. Now that's not the same thing. Closing is when you get them to say yes, then the yeah. negotiating starts at that point. And in fact, if you look at, uh, if you go back to big IT services companies uh, and they're negotiating 100, 200, $300 million deals over a five year period, what often happens is they'll have a lead, uh, a bid lead uh, that's part of that team that runs the entire uh, bid solutions team. They'll be the lead negotiator, but they won't be the salesperson. The salespersons found that lead, nurtured that lead, and brought it to the table. And then the bid lead, who is normally you know, professional services, rational, process-oriented, trained negotiator, they negotiate these big deals. And so if you just look at that and say, well, the same principle applies to a $400 million deal as it does to a half million dollar deal, even a 50K deal, a 100K deal, it's a different skill set. Totally. Because... The salespeople I know, they're super motivated to get that close, to get the deal yeah. closed. They will say almost anything. They'll give away <laughs> the farm to get it closed. They'll, they want to be friendly. They want to be nice. They want to give, yeah. give, give. The negotiator is the opposite. Like you don't want to give anything you don't have to give. Exactly. You want, so these are two totally different In fact, people. I want to claim more value. My whole persona is I want to claim as much value, economic and non-economic, as I possibly can. That's what well, my job is. Yes, while not killing the deal. And it's Correct. a very tough job because you have to go that narrow line. And that's why they're two totally different skill sets. Most people don't have both. Most are suited exactly. for one or the other. Now, talk about it. When you're negotiating, what are the strategies you use to actually get that party on the other side to agree to the terms you want? So I think there's a few things here, Steve. Um, there's some, you know, lots of research has been done about 
people think, so your audience, a lot of people think you're either a natural negotiator or you're not. It's, it's not true. Yes, some people happen to be good on their feet at negotiating, but all the research points to is those people that prepare and those people that have templates consistently negotiate far better deals than, the, than those that don't. You might meet some brilliant off-the-cuff negotiators, but over a period of time, anyone that's got the tools, has got some templates, and can uh, apply a discipline and a process will make better deals consistently over the long run. It's a fact. That makes sense. So first of all, it makes sense because you have to know what you're negotiating for. Like a lot of people, they don't exactly know what, they, what their bottom line is, what they really need. They're trying to figure it out during the negotiation and they are reacting. Like whatever exactly. the other party says they react to. That's not a good strategy. You need to take control of the situation, actually move yeah. it to the destination you want. Let's talk about that process. I've got a very simple kind of, I've, I've boiled it down to a five-step process. And I'm not saying it's the only process. And if you talk to 20 negotiators, they'll all have their own version. But I've codified my thinking into some simple five-step processes. And in fact, I've even written a workbook, which people can buy, which are templates around this five-step process. So the first step is what are the objectives? What are the goals? What are you trying to achieve? And what's your counterparty trying to achieve? Some really simple stuff. Um, and also a really critical thing, what criteria will you both use to judge this is a good deal? That normally gets completely missed. And those criteria should be objective so that you and me, if we're negotiating a deal, could look at these criteria from above and go, yeah, they're fair, they're reasonable. Let's construct a deal around these criteria. If, if your listeners just do that one thing, they'll get much better deals out the other side. And it's quite hard to do, think it through. Then the second thing is, well, you need a process, timeline. How many sequences are we going to go through to negotiate this deal? I mean, how many deals, Steve, have you been involved in where it's gone on for like a year, two years, three years, and it just gets dragged along in this horrible thing turns up at the end of the day, which is nothing like what you expected? Because there was no process, there were no gates, no decision criteria and no process steps. So that's kind of number two. Then number three is you sit down and work out what are the variables I'm negotiating on? Give me some, I'll give you some practical examples. So obviously there's price, then there's payment terms, and there's length of contract, and there's termination clauses, and there's IP. So top of my head, I've got five that you can negotiate around. So write them down on a bit of paper and then do one simple thing. Draw two columns. And for each one, at the top of the column says, what's my best outcome I want? And what's the worst outcome I'll accept? And for each variable, just write down what they are. So you've got five variables, two columns. You'll have 10 parameters. That's your negotiating scorecard. And you can move the dials around. So if you give a bit on price, you expect to receive a bit on payment terms. That simple framework will take you a very long way. Step four is issues. What are the issues in the deal? Things crop up, call them objections, call them issues, challenges, whatever you like. You've got to keep track of them or else what you find is as you negotiate the deal, you miss something, it gets brought in at the last moment by your counterparty and it can disrupt the deal. So keep track of them and address them. And the last thing is it's not over until you've got a signed contract with all of the service level agreements, the KPIs at the back have all been negotiated and agreed. Because whoever gets hold of this contract on your team, who's going to deliver whatever you've promised, is going to get measured against what's in the contract. So make sure you've negotiated and thought clearly about what KPIs we're going to sign up to. And just those simple five steps practically will absolutely definitely give you a better outcome every time. That is incredibly useful. I've had nobody lay it out so clearly and so concisely. Every, everything you said is true. It's absolutely true. And people just don't do that. Yeah. They, they sort of go ad hoc into it and they're like just winging it. You know, it's a miracle the deal ever closes. And I'm sure exactly. they could get such a better deal. Like you yeah. said, just the first step is so vital. Like thinking, 
you know, what does this party want? What do I want yeah. out of the deal to make it successful? There's a whole other aspect to negotiating, and that is the negotiator's role within the company. So you have the salesperson who wants to say yes. They, they get a commission on closing. So they just yeah. want the deal to go through no matter what. <laughs> then you have the lawyer who only wants to say no because yep. they're worried about any risk that the company is going to take. And then the negotiator is that person in the middle, in the bridge. Yeah. Explain the negotiator's role between, the, between those two other parties. And then you times that by, uh, you add another three people in. You've got your counterparty negotiator, their lawyer, and their um, internal kind of like client, the budget holder. So now I've got six people, all of which have different agendas, all of which want different things. So what I recommend is the negotiator's skill, what they have to have is the ability to coordinate stakeholders. They've got to be able to corral these different perspectives and start bringing them together on both sides of the table. Once, again, one practical thing on lawyers. I've worked with many, many lawyers over my years. I'm sure you have as well, Steve, uh, and you continue to to this day. I start with, a lot of people start with their lawyers when they get the terms and conditions from the counterparty, which is 50 pages, and they start going through them. And the lawyers then start marking it up. And they love that because that's what they do. Um, and they'll find hundreds of things that they want to change. My recommendation is get one piece of paper, a4 on one side and write down the principles of the deal not the detail of the deal the principles of the deal then go to your lawyer and say right we want to negotiate the contract based upon these principles now start redlining where where the contract doesn't meet our principles that one thing will save you a lot of money on legal fees and legal time and it will make it much easier with your counterparty because now you're not arguing about the nuances of wording and, and what might happen in this scenario and that scenario. It's very practical. The things that if these principles aren't met, we can't do a deal. So give me an example of principles. So you, we really nail it down. Let's start with some, some commercial principles, Steve. So what would I write down on my bit of paper? Let's say I'm the seller and I'm negotiating with a buyer uh, and it's for a million pound uh, services contract for delivering some marketing services. So one of the principles is, is um, I want to make sure that the, in the statement of work at the back in the schedule, the KPIs, I want no more than five or maximum seven KPIs. It's a principle. Why is that important? I've seen contracts at the back in the schedules with 35 KPIs. It's insane. So if you don't lay that out at the beginning, what happens in the negotiation of the contract is they keep adding things in and it keeps on going. And it's a way of stopping the lawyers and also procurement on the buy side from getting too carried away with, let's have these 35 KPIs. That's one thing. Another principle would be IP. IP is a great one. Some very large firms, if it's a consulting type project, will say, any work you do uh, with us um, belongs to us. All the IP is ours. You can keep the IP that you bring to the party, but obviously anything you create with us is our IP. And it's a trap. And it's a trap because if you're in consulting of any kind and you allow that clause to go through, the client's got carte blanche to come after you with any client, any work you do in a similar field and say, no, 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 that slide looks like the one that you did for us. Well, that's our IP, you're in breach. So what you normally do is a consultancy firm principle would be, we own all the IP, we'll license the new bit to you in perpetuity to use free of charge forever, but we own the IP. And I've had that clause on probably four or five negotiations, the same thing's happened. And they always say, no, 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 we can't do that. And when you say, well, why? They say, well, we've paid for it, it's our IP. And when you explain it's a restriction of trade, you would stop us from working forever. You want to pay us $50 million for that clause? Sure, we'll talk to you. But if you don't, let's be sensible. So those are the kind of principles that, that you're looking for when you're laying down the principles of the negotiation. Makes a lot of sense. You really nailed it down for everybody. So when you're negotiating, should the negotiator negotiate the whole deal before bringing in the lawyer? 
or how does it go? Does it ble mm. one bleed into the other? There's no right or wrong to this, I don't think. But what I believe in is when you're starting to negotiate a deal, and you're negotiating the commercials, you're working out payment terms and the price and the KPIs and all sorts of stuff. Personally, if I'm the seller, it's on my paper. So I'll give you my contract, get your lawyers to start to go through it. Here's the principles we're trying to agree. If it's on their paper, I say, look, give me your T's and C's. We'll do a quick scan and check for anything that's a red line for us. Because why are we going to waste six weeks negotiating if there are clauses in there that we just can't sign up to? So I, it's a two-pass process normally. I like to get the T's and C's right up front, spot any red lines. Assuming there are no red lines, then you can start to negotiate the overall commercial construct. Then you write down your key principles, and then you go to work on the detail of the contract. That's, that's my perfect. personal way. That makes a lot of sense. That, that's really right on. So let's say their lawyer is being totally unreasonable. Like they're... <laughs> They want to close the deal, but their legal department is just a roadblock. What do you do? So I don't know if any of your uh, listeners have gone, uh, have looked at stakeholder mapping, but stakeholder mapping is a very simple tool. Look it up online, uh, building a stakeholder map. And what it looks at is, is that in a deal, let's say there's six people involved in the deal, the lawyer's one and the uh, chief marketing officer uh, is the other because they hold the budget. And then there's the procurement people and then there's a few others. What you do is you, you draw out a little matrix and the matrix says this um, on the left hand side of the, so you draw a line on the bottom and one vertically. On the left hand side is they're really against us. So they don't like us, they don't wanna work with us. On the right hand side is they're real fans. They're massive fans of us. And then from kind of like the bottom to the top is how much do we influence their area of work? And what you're looking for is the lawyer for some reason may not, you know, they may have had a bad experience with our company in the past, or they may just have taken uh, offense to the, the contractual terms or the commercial terms. At some point on that stakeholder map, you've got to have the budget holder who ultimately is accountable on the right-hand side as a fan saying, you know, team, go to work on the negotiations by all means, knock yourself out in the contracts, but I want to get this deal done because I want an outcome that this service provider can deliver. When the lawyers go too far, you have what I call a principle to principle discussion. If I'm the CEO of the agency that's going to deliver the service, I'm gonna go and have a one-on-one -on -one with the CMO who holds the budget and say, look, we've agreed some principles. We've got a commercial construct. We can deliver your outcomes as promised. The, your lawyer is getting really stuck in to three or four terms that we aren't gonna be able to sign up to. We believe we're being completely reasonable. Can you get your lawyer to back off? What normally happens is a discussion will ensue and then the lawyer will get calmed down because the budget holder's got to sit there eventually and be accountable for the outcomes. The lawyer's there to protect the business and to negotiate appropriate terms, but they don't have carte blanche. And the CMO will go, there's a commercial risk around this term that you're trying to negotiate. I'm prepared to accept the commercial risk against that particular term. And then normally it goes quiet. Another problem people have is the negotiations drag on and on. What <laughs> are your strategies for actually getting it done within a reasonable time frame? This isn't a, it works every time, but a simple principle is, let's say I'm starting a, a negotiation now. Uh, so I'm, I'm a supplier, I'm negotiating with the client. Um, I know I'm down to the kind of the preferred supplier, but I'm not, I've not got a contract yet. I'm just, I think I'm the preferred supplier. What I'd do as the negotiator, the lead negotiator is on the sell side is, I'd write down a simple four stage negotiation. So we're going to start off on stage one, which is uh, we're going to exchange some emails around some things that are on our mind uh, around this deal. And then stage two is, well, we're going to start to actually nail down for the six variables that uh, are under consideration, what those kind of like different parameters are. And then stage three is we're going to like finalize some terms in the contract. And then stage four is we're going to finalize the KPIs uh, and then we're going to get the contract signed in stage five. Okay. So I write that down. And then I write down some, some milestones when I go, okay, well, my milestone is by the middle of September, I want all of the early emails done. By the end of September, I want to get to stage two. 
middle of October, stage three, end of October, stage four, contract signed by middle of November. And then for each of the stages, I write down, there are three or four things, gates, as I would call them, to get from one stage to the next. And they're little checklists. You write down your own checklist at each stage. So you've now got five steps, milestones, and three criteria gates at each stage. It can be handwritten. I then give it to my uh, counterparty negotiator. Does this look reasonable? Have I got anything wrong? At what point do we need to engage your procurement team? Because we need to get onto your preferred suppliers list so that when we invoice, we can actually get a purchase order number in advance, invoice against it and get paid. And they'll go, okay, that, that, that looks doable. Bit tight, but it's doable. And what that gives you is every time it starts to slip a bit, you can go back to that time frame and say, well, what did we get wrong? Why is it now being delayed? We've, meet, we've met these criteria at this stage. I thought we were into stage three. And they'll go, yeah, okay, I thought we were as well. But unfortunately, you know, legal have got a problem with X, Y, and Z. And you go, okay, so let's add that into stage two to three. And let's get legal to say, well, what's a reasonable time frame to get this resolved? <clears throat> so you use it as a seller or as just like one part of the deal uh, side. It gives you a cadence. It gives you a reference point to go back to your counterparty and say, we agreed in principle to this. It's slipping. Why is it slipping? If you don't have that, you'll get the constant. And we've both been there. Uh, I'm sure, where someone says, yeah, yeah, the deal's nearly done. And I'll be like, okay, what's nearly done? Well, you know, we're close to getting contract signed. So end of September. Okay, end of September. End of September comes. Yeah, it's not quite closed yet. Oh, really? Why is that? Well, we've got a problem with one of the terms. All right. I thought you'd done the terms before. Yeah, we had them, but something, and then it goes on. And then it unravels. And once it gets past a certain period of time, people lose interest. They get busy. They do other things. And then even worse, they come back to the deal and they go, well, oh, I thought something different. There's something else I want in the deal. There's something new. And you're like, oh, God. And that's why you need a simple process with timings on it to help you manage your counterparty. So you map everything out. It's all about yeah. mapping it out, putting yourself in the other party's shoes to understand what they need to get done, really understanding their process as well as your own, and making sure both parties agree to it. And then uh, setting reasonable but aggressive deadlines. Like, yep. we, we're going to do this. We know we can get it done by this date, but can't. And often, I'm sure you go back to them and say, can we push that deadline up? Like, yep. what can we do to get this deadline up? Because we both want to get this closed. Why exactly. should it take three months? Why can't we do it in two months? What do we have to do to get this done in two months? And then you. That's right. And if you can get them to agree to that up front, then you have basically a plan that you're executing on and if you deviate from the plan you have a reason to talk so you always have you can come back you've always got a reason to talk and that's it steve you've always got a reason to talk it opens the door to dialogue it's a reference point i think i think human beings like reference points that they can go back to about something that they agreed to which wasn't draconian it wasn't difficult it was something they agreed to in principle and it helps you stick to the principles same thing and it yeah, stops and, game playing as well. And negotiating isn't a winner take all thing. It's a win win. So basically, you want to figure out what they need to be a winner on their side, what you need to be a winner, and get both parties committed to that and driving towards that. That's successful negotiation. So tell us a story about the toughest negotiation, the one where you lost <laughs> the most hair on your head negotiation you have had in your life. Wow. Okay. I've got one in my head. But um, I actually had a different one, but I've just thought of another one. You could tell um, us two, two different stories. <laughs> I'll tell you the one that's in my head right now, which was, and I won't name any people because it's not fair to the people, but uh, it was, I'd got my uh, business into trouble uh, uh, many, many years ago. And I'm always very open about the mistakes I make in life. I learn more from my mistakes than I do from my successes, definitely. And I'd made some mistakes and I got my business into trouble. Uh, I hadn't spotted certain things coming. And I had some creditors uh, that I owed money to. It, it was a bonus that I owed, uh, that I owed to these uh, creditors. There were people that worked for me that I owed bonuses to. And uh, they were unsecured creditors. So again, for your audience, unsecured, um, 
bank debt is always secured against the assets of the business of some kind. These were unsecured creditors. And I owed them quite a lot of money. And it was all due. And I had no problems with what was owed. But we couldn't afford to pay right then. So I had to agree a payment plan with these unsecured creditors over a period of three years to pay them out this sum of money. There were three of them uh, that were all kind of joined together. The problem we had was my lawyers actually said to me, that just, well, in fact, it was my corporate finance team at the time said to me, if, if you want, Mike, don't bother renegotiating the deal. Don't bother paying them out over time. Just dump the company, dump the creditors, phoenix the company, start it again. And then those creditors will disappear and you'll have saved yourself a whole ton of money and pain. And I said, that's not me. That's not what I do. I owe these people money. We can pay them over time. We're going to pay them over time. And my kind of advisory team at the time were like, I think he's a bit crazy. I don't know why you do that. And I do it because those are my principles. And every day when I wake up, even now, I did the right thing. And I'm pleased I did the right thing. And so the reason it got really difficult was we were, there was one meeting. This is back to the lawyers again. We were in a room at my lawyers. We were, wow, we were at the 22nd of December, I think, something like that. And the bank was on my back to get this deal done. Because without the deal being done, the bank was at risk. And the bank said to me, if you don't get the deal done before Christmas, we'll take the keys to the business off you. You'll lose the business. And I said, it's the 22nd of December. They said, yeah, I know. I put the phone down. I'm like, okay, great. So we're at my lawyers and there's the three of them with their lawyer. There's me, my lawyer, and one of my advisors. And we're trying to strike a deal. And at one point, <laughs> it got really heated. The guy on the counterparty stood up. He banged the table. This is a very, very mild-mannered, gentle guy, a lovely guy, genuinely lovely guy. He was absolutely outraged. He banged the table and he said, get your lawyer to back down because my lawyer was being really aggressive and they were being pretty reasonable, actually. And so I was faced internally, mentally going, if I don't close this deal, the bank's going to take the keys off me. And it's the 22nd of December. Mm, okay, this is, this, this is quite life-changing. <laughs> and I stopped the meeting and I said, this has got really heated. Let me stop the meeting. Take a half hour break, come back later. So they agreed. I got my lawyer and said to my lawyer, I know you're trying to defend me. I know you're trying to defend my position. Leave it to me. He said, no, 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 no. But this thing, I said, it's my commercial risk. Leave it to me. I went to the three people who I'm negotiating with and said, can I have a, a chat with you without your lawyers? And the lawyer went, no, 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 you can't do that. And they went, no, <laughs> let's do that. And we then sat, I think the four of us from memory. And in like 15 minutes, we finalized the, the deal. Got the lawyers back in the room and said, right, now write the agreement based around what we've agreed because we've agreed to this deal structure. And it was an important lesson about your lawyers should act on your behalf aggressively to an extent because they're there to defend your position. But there's a time to back them down. There's also a time with your counterparty to say, let's get the lawyers out of the room. Let's get the advisors out of the room. Let's have a principle to principle discussion. We want to get the deal done. Broadly, what are the outlined commercial terms for this? And then you can give that on one bit of A4 to the people that are doing the deal and they can do all the contracts. And it was, a, it was a definite lesson in life about there's nothing like being fully accountable. It was my business. I was the only shareholder. It was, I could lose everything if I don't get this right. It was meaningful money, really meaningful money to us and to the counterparty. And it was a very pragmatic view of, okay, it's more important to get the deal done than it is to get exactly the terms that we want in that deal. Great story. Thank you for sharing that. Pleasure. Are there any myths in your industry, in negotiating, that you can dispel? The first one is uh, that um, negotiation experts are as kind of as rare as hen's teeth. So that the audience know that kind of phrase, but as rare as hen's teeth, hens don't have any teeth. So expert negotiators are exceptionally rare. It's not true. It's a myth. 
people like to believe that there are these mythical characters who are amazing negotiators and they're the only ones that can do deals. It's nonsense. If you just do some training and you have some templates and you practice and you prepare, you'll be staggered as to how good a negotiator you are. So don't let any of your kind of audience, your listeners believe that negotiations are a, a very difficult, undefined art form that only the talented, insightful people can, can do. It's not true. Anyone can do it if you're prepared to prepare. Second one I had down was that um, you don't need any training to be a negotiator. You just need instincts. And it's linked to the first one. It's like, that's just not true. If you looked at really, really expert negotiators, often, not always, but often what's happened is there's a bag carrier. In the background, someone's done an awful lot of research, an awful lot of preparation. You just don't happen to see it. Years and years ago, probably 25 years ago, now, I met a guy that used to negotiate on behalf of airlines buying aircraft. So you can imagine these are like $100 million, $500 million deals. They're enormous deals. He was the lead negotiator on behalf of his client. He was a consultant. But he had someone that worked with him full time doing all the research. And then he went into bat to negotiate the deals. So there's always someone in the background who's doing a lot of preparation work. It just happens the person, the man or the woman in front of you, looks like they're a natural born negotiator. The reality is they're exceptionally well prepared. And I think that this is about the kind of the psychology of, of negotiation. Uh, people say, oh, you know, um, I'm no good in front of people. I fold. You know, I, I just kind of fold because I, I, I kind of give in too easily. Okay. And uh, people say, well, that's just a common trait of, of, of everyone that negotiates, apart from the, the special ones. It's, an, it's not true. It's a myth. And it's a myth because if you watch people who are extremely confident in front of an audience, and that's what negotiation is, a lot of it is confidence and preparation. Behind the scenes, they've done a huge amount of work to prepare for that session, and they've thought through all the scenarios. And they've probably rehearsed if it's a big deal as well. When you look at uh, when Steve Jobs was presenting you know, way back in the day, um, the first, was it the iPod, I think, that he released? Apparently, on that stage in front of that big audience, he would practiced for days. It looked like he was just a natural performer. He'd practiced for days. And the same thing happens in negotiation. Confidence. So if I'm negotiating with you, Steve, and you've prepared and I've prepared, We'll have a very rational, very confident conversation, and you'll see how far you can go with me, and I'll see how far you can, I can go with you, because we have that confidence, because we're well prepared. If I'm negotiating with you, you've not prepared, and you're highly emotional, and you're all over the place, then I'm going to win the deal, because I'll play to that emotion. I'll poke the bear, because I know that I'm going to get a rise out of you at some point. And so... It's a myth that it's a, you know, I don't have any confidence, therefore I can't negotiate. You just need to prepare more maybe than others and stick to the script. Don't get blown off course. Stick to the script, have boundaries, as we discussed, and get the deal done. Anyone can do it. Thank you, Mike, for that. I have one final question before we wrap up, and that's what's the best advice you've ever received? So money is incredible hard, incredibly hard to get and very easy to lose. And it sounds so simple, but when you think it through, it can take tens of years to build up 100K of savings. It can take a moment in time to destroy all that value, buying a bad property, buying a car that you didn't really need, but you wanted and actually lost value overnight. It's really simple to lose money. It's very hard to make it and keep it. Mike, thank you for being with us. Before we go, I want you to tell our listeners how they can find you. But the simplest is I'm on LinkedIn. So if you want to find me, I'm on LinkedIn, Mike Lander on LinkedIn, uh, and uh, you'll find me easily on there. Um, you can also buy our book. So there's a new book, this negotiation workbook, and it's called, um, if you go to Higgle, H-I-G-G-L-E, .piscari.com 
you'll find our negotiation workbook. Uh, and then, of course, there's always our website, scary.com. I hope you enjoyed the show. If you liked it, hit the subscribe button and share it with your friends. You can help us create more great content by subscribing and sharing. Also, if you want to access our online startup program, our investor network, and our entrepreneur resources, just come to founderspace.com.